Okay, Year 12, good morning. Uh, well, it will be morning when you see this uh, on YouTube, so I apologise. Um, clearly, I am not recording this in the morning. I'm recording this late at night, and clearly, I'm recording this at home. Uh, welcome to my experiment uh, in seeing whether or not I can make this version work. Now, the idea behind this is that rather than cavorting for your amusement in front of a board where you can't necessarily see the PowerPoint, you can instead uh, see the PowerPoint on the screen and just have my rather frightening features off to one side, which means you can ignore them if you wish. Now, obviously at the moment, my frightening fizzog is filling the screen, but that's just because it's an introduction. So, welcome. This is my attempt to talk through the notes on Thatcher and social policy, uh, which should take us through the most part of Thatcher and the death of consensus. Now, you've got that in the PDF that we gave to you earlier in the year before Easter. But the idea is that I can talk you through the notes on this one. Now, the last uh, PowerPoint I gave you, I said you could make your notes yourself uh, because it was a Mr. Uh, Podlaski PowerPoint and he's better at that than me. So mine requires a little bit more introduction and a bit more talking around it. So if I've got my software right, I can do this and take you to this screen like that. Hello, ah, there it is, brilliant. So, um, if I do that, there we go. So what you've got here is a bit of an infographic that was about Thatcher's Britain. And um, the thinking behind this infographic was that it was supposed to be able to be used, uh, but then I actually looked at it properly and I saw that it was a comparative thing about uh, economic crises and wasn't terribly helpful at all. So I apologize, uh, we, won't, we won't dwell too long on it. Thatcher's Britain then is what we're gonna talk about. You already know a fair bit about why she was elected at various points. What we now need to do is find out what it was she actually did and what it was that the Conservatives did when they were in power for this era. Now, remember, we finish in 1997. Thatcher resigns in 1990. So we've got this period from 1979 through to 1990, just over a decade, to cover. Now, I'm hoping to do this relatively quickly. I hope I won't go on too many tangents. We'll see how we go. So social policy, the first thing we need to talk about, and I'll try not to gabble too much, is the NHS, uh, which is fitting, given what we're experiencing right now. So there you are at home watching it. I mean, I'm assuming you're at home. Uh, you should be at home, stay at home. Uh, and here I am in my home uh, recording this um, on a very low quality video and I apologize. So the first thing we should do with the, in terms of social policy in the NHS was decide that government was necessarily a bad thing. Now this was nothing new. Many conservatives had already believed that uh, Basically, government had become too big. It had become overweening. It wasn't working properly. It, it built in waste. And they looked to uh, neoliberal ideas. Now, you might have heard the term neoliberal. Um, it isn't just an insult. It is, in fact, uh, a valid economic theory. You might not know it's an insult, and I apologise if you don't. Neoliberalism is the idea that government cannot... Um, not will not, just cannot, it, it's physically incapable of running things efficiently. And instead what it needs is a profit motive to keep things lean, uh, to keep things efficient. So if you're always trying to squeeze out extra value, you will always run it uh, or run whatever at the lowest possible cost and the most efficient method. And this does make a modicum of sense. And so if you take um, the NHS as an example, Thatcher's first move there was she realised she couldn't get rid of it. Socialised healthcare was here to stay and it was popular. People liked it. It would be electoral suicide to try and destroy it. Very early on, they developed an, a method that uh, basically the NHS needed to be kept. It was a good idea, but it needed to be more business motivated. And so she applied business principles to this very important government department. So they created trusts for hospitals and doctors that were self-governing, that the government would not interfere with. They created competition between different GP surgeries, allowing uh, individuals to register at any particular GP surgery they wished. So you go to one with better doctors, you go to one that had a higher success rate. Um, and that allowed people effectively to have a choice. Now, you've got to understand what this means. It's choice in a very middle-class way. People with money had the choice, they could move around, they could travel. People who did not have the money, who did not have the ability, could not choose to move their GP surgery. And their surgery might not be doing as well because the richer patients are going elsewhere or because the patients who are easier to care for are going elsewhere, so their caseloads get larger and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, it gave the appearance of choice and was popular. It also made GPs, general practitioners, people who'd studied medicine for many years, 
into budget holders. Many of them would receive no training for this. Now, this might not sound a terribly awful idea or indeed a terribly good idea. It might just sound like a, an idea. Why not? It makes sense, right? Well, speaking as a teacher, for example, I have received no training in budget holding. As a head of department, I have come into contact with the idea of holding a budget. Now, it, it just so happens that because of the way my brain works, I, I quite like that. I'm reasonably good at it, but by no means one of the best. Other people have been trained and they are far superior to I. For example, um, my mother uh, is a budget holder. She's very good at this. Uh, hi, mum, if you're watching. Um, and the idea of giving all GPs the budgets and allowing them to run it makes sense in theory, but in practice, this can lead to some problems and will later down the line. But the point is, that's what the government do. And it is electorally popular. People like the idea. It sounds logical. It allows them to uh, exercise more economic discipline. Doctors are no longer uh, prescribing treatment based on, well, any kind of notion. They now have to work out what that's going to cost them. And the theory was it would stop them being so wasteful. Now, there's nothing to say that the NHS is wasteful, but there is a, a prevailing argument, and there was certainly evidence to suggest that the NHS kind of prescribed things it didn't need to. If people came in and asked for antibiotics, but they were having a viral infection, they get the antibiotics because it made them feel better. The placebo effect is well documented as being a, an effective method of treating people. So again, this kind of makes sense, but also you can see the problem here. These drugs cost money and the drugs that they're being prescribed are going up in price. If you're just prescribing them willy-nilly, that's going to be cost, not cost-effective at all. Furthermore, it leads to problems of um, diseases becoming uh, resistant to treatment. So there were, there were several problems here. Uh, they tried prescription charges. That hadn't really worked. And Thatcher's conservatives argued that this would provide some kind of discipline. The problem it did was it also brought in a, a a level of service that sort of well became more about the money i guess and less about the patient so it's balanced in fuzzy ways the next thing she turned her sights to being a former education secretary was schools and she already had some concerns that were shared by wider society um, up until 1986 there were two different forms of exams there were o levels and there were cse's o levels were taken by grammar schools and cse's a certificate of secondary education was taken by well pretty much everybody else o levels were considered academically hard cse's were considered academically not rigorous um, and the split between them was entirely arbitrary um, the theory went that one was more vocational the cse's and one was more academic the o levels but it didn't stop people essentially viewing O-levels as better. And O-levels themselves had issues. They were very uh, writing-based. They were writing for the point of writing. They weren't really training for anything in the workplace. Um, now, nowadays, this idea of training for the workplace in schools is very in vogue. And I'd argue that's entirely why you're here and it's entirely what you're studying for. It's very pervasive. Uh, and I'd argue that your generation in particular um, have taken this on board as almost like a Zen Cohen or uh, some kind of uh, fundamental philosophy. It was not always the case. Certainly my education wasn't about preparing me to be a teacher. It was the last thing I ever wanted to do, by the way. Don't get me wrong, I love it. But it wasn't what I trained for. Uh, the concept of education as training for the world of work never really entered my mind. Now, you ask my father of a different generation, and he would have a very different answer. He would tell you that that's exactly what education should be, right down to the form of dress you wear. He would be um, well, slightly appalled that I've been teaching in a scratchy jumper I've been wearing for a couple of days and a T-shirt without a collar. I'm not wearing a suit. And so in 88, 1988, the Conservative government introduced a national curriculum. And this was a means of making sure that all schools taught the same thing. Now, there is something to this. Uh, one of the experiences of people involved in government, their children have been moved around the country as they changed their government jobs, as they've moved for uh, different elections, and they found their children got taught the same thing, dinosaurs as it happened, uh, at every single school, because it just so happened to be where, where they were teaching and what they wanted to teach at that particular moment. As a consequence, their children had a very narrow education. So the national curriculum was a means of trying to control what all schools taught at any given moment, so that if you were moving schools at any particular moment to follow jobs or to go somewhere uh, more effective, um, wherever you ended up, 
you were taught the next bit in the step and it meant that you got a, a similar service wherever you're going now that makes a lot of sense i i i do believe a national curriculum is a good idea it, it prevents people from well essentially teaching to hobbyist ideas which is what i do otherwise the next thing they brought in were grant maintained schools before this point schools were run almost entirely by the local authority and that meant as a teacher for example you uh, arrived and you worked for the local authority if a job went in one school but a job opened up in another school then they would move the teacher now i once managed a member of staff who'd had that happen to her. She was an RA, RE teacher, she was very fond of the RE bit, but she'd been redeployed as a geography teacher and then redeployed again as a history teacher by the time I met her. This can lead to obvious problems. Um, these people are not specialists in the subjects they necessarily teach. A grant maintained school allowed a school to opt out of local authority control, to take control of some of their own budget, and to make decisions based on the local area. You can see why this is quite popular. And the very first voluntary grant maintained school in the UK was Ecclesbourne, um, which caused a lot of trouble at the time. Now I wasn't here then. Uh, I know a few people who were and who still feel quite strongly about it. But the fact of the matter was, uh, I believe the fifth was the one I went to. Uh, Trinity in Carlisle, in case you're wondering, it might not be fifth, you can check it yourselves and no doubt I'll be wrong. Uh, but the thing was, grant maintained schools meant that they had a more direct uh, control over their own uh, exam boards and it was the idea that you could choose exam boards for perhaps the first time. Previous to this point, there'd been national exam boards. So when I went to school in Carlisle, which is just south of the border with Scotland, about 15 very important miles away, um, we learned uh, the Kent Maths Project which is about as geographically far from Carlisle as it's possible to get. Uh, but we'd chosen it because it worked, or rather our teachers believed it worked. So grant maintained schools allowed you to do that sort of thing, which you might not be able to do as a local authority controlled school. Uh, the guy in charge of this, Sir Keith Joseph, it was his children that had moved around, might not have been dinosaurs, but the point was they kept learning the same things. The trouble is they replaced the O-levels and CSEs with a single qualification called the GCSE, the General Certificate of Secondary Education. And the idea was they tried to combine the academic principles of the O-levels, the classics and Latin, uh, linguistics, uh, English, and bring in the more vocational aspects of the humanities, such as history and geography, uh, the CSEs, and sort of mash them together. Um, and many people argued that GCSEs were not as academically rigorous as O-levels, that they were a step up from CSEs. So they replaced a two-tier system that a lot of people expect, uh, accepted and expected with a single-tier system. Now, the idea behind this was meritocratic. Everyone took the same exams, everyone had the same chance of success, everyone had the same outcomes. But of course, you've got to bear in mind this is a conservative idea. And one of the things conservatism, and if you learn in politics, you'll learn about this very shortly, uh, is that people have a level, that, that human beings are genetically predisposed to a particular area and trying to beat that is actually quite harmful. So the idea of GCSEs was also that people could fail. But of course, failure reflects badly on the system. And therefore, as a political football, as education is, this is going to have repercussions later in time. But for now, you just need to know that people saw the GCSEs as being less academically rigorous. I'm not sure I agree, but then I wouldn't. I did GCSEs. Um, the content of the curricula, i.e. what actually went into that national curriculum, was the subject of a lot of debate. Uh, now, another story for the history curriculum, originally it was very prescriptive, it was rapidly toned down, and the original national curriculum for history, a lot of people kicked against it. I was one of the students that went through that, and, and I quite liked it. I, I thought it had a lot of stuff in there, but there was also a lot of stuff in there that I'm quite glad we got rid of. For example, the agricultural revolution had to be taught. My school interpreted this for a whole year, and trust me when I say, yeah, it's fascinating, but I didn't realise just how fascinating until I was much older, and perhaps the subject matter isn't really the preserve of year eights. So the content of curricula was, was under debate. And Thatcher herself didn't really take much of a role in it. And the government themselves, once they'd set up the concept, kind of left it to the Department of Education, kind of left it to the civil servants, and kind of left it to the schools in many ways to debate that and to shape that, which you could argue, again, fits in with this idea of Thatcher trying to create a, a whole uh, society, she would argue with the term society, of individuals, of people who do are moving their own way and doing their own thing. Thatcher herself wasn't very consistent on this, and uh, she 
changed her views in light of evidence, in fairness, multiple times. And you could argue that maybe that's politically not a good idea. We talked about the divisions in the Labour Party. I've said that any division is a good division because it means you argue things out. But this is not shared by the vast majority of the population. You know this. We've been through a general election. We are currently in lockdown where people are still debating this. Unity is king. And it always has been. So it made Thatcher look less consistent for good or ill. Universities, they were seen as a sort of hotbed of socialism. They were seen as a hotbed of resentment and strikes. And um, students themselves tended to be quite lefty. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, education is associated with left wing thought. Don't ask me why, it just is. It has historically been so and remains so, even though the right wing have made great strides in uh, education, such as. Uh, for banking, for example, and in that area. Now, I know many people involved in banking. I know many people that took accountancy who are left wing. And I know people in history who are right wing. My point being, in general terms, universities were seen as quite left wing. As a consequence, they were seen as a threat. And so funding was cut from 1981. The idea was that if people could afford to go to university, they could pay their own way and you didn't have to pay as much of a grant. Now, up until this point, students could go to university under the plans by Wilson, and they got paid a grant to go, opening it up to a wide swathe of people that otherwise simply wouldn't have had the opportunity. Trouble is, as they're cutting budgets, there are more students going to university, the university has less money to, to spread around, and so you end up with a very thin spread, like uh, I don't know, spreading um, margarine on your bread and then scraping it off again. That's why it's called scrape in some working class families. And so it was, in 1988, there was a university funding council set up, and their job was to work out how much money the universities actually needed. The trouble was the focus was on the economics of the matter rather than on research. So uh, a university that was spending a lot of money on research, but not much on students, and bear in mind universities are where a lot of research takes place. Um, they didn't get the same consideration as a university that was doing well by students and was seen successful by students and therefore gaining student numbers. They got more of a share of that money, the pot from the government, than did the research facilities. Now, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, and frankly, it doesn't matter at the time. This was seen as both a positive and a negative. You can see why people saw it as a positive. It's rewarding uh, what's going well rather than what's going badly. But it's a negative because it means that not everybody can go, and those that go to research institutions and want to actually further the cause of human knowledge might not be funded the same way. Now, you could argue that it's very clear what my views are, and you'd probably be right with those. One thing it did do was uh, it monkeyed with the idea of security of tenure. Up until this point, if you become a, a university professor, you were pretty much made. Um, you had a job for life. That, by the way, was my aim. Um, because you can, you can teach lessons and they don't have to be terribly good. I, I was uh, taught by one of the greatest lecturers I've ever known, but he was not a good teacher. Um, he was an amazing guy, an amazing researcher. And because this is a video, I shan't name him. Um, but he, he was fantastic, but he wasn't the greatest communicator. Uh, he was wonderful at writing books. Um, very, very uh, charismatic in his way. Um, and I could tell you a great number of anecdotes, but I shan't. They're on a video and this is publicly available. But the point is, he wasn't the greatest teacher in the world. And you could argue that perhaps he shouldn't have had his job, that perhaps he should have retrained. Another teacher of mine was a fantastic communicator, a fantastic teacher but not a great researcher. Now, some of my friends in the student body preferred that person, uh, I was one of them, and some of them preferred uh, the other lecturer who wasn't a great communicator, but a great researcher. You see my point. With security of tenure, you could have both, and they could be wildly further on those spectrum uh, than my two lecturers who were far apart, but not massively apart in terms of their quality. They just had different qualities. So security of tenure was a problem, and the funding meant that it stopped being a thing. Um, also, uh, there were two forms of university at this point. There were polytechnics that were more vocational. They, they were things that uh, trained people in uh, practical subjects, things that I can't do. Um, so one polytechnic was St. Martin's College, it was called, um, in uh, Lancaster. And they were slowly encouraged to become uh, UFCs, 
uh, or university colleges, I forget what the F stands for, um, rather than being polytechnics. Now this has a problem, they have to become more academic, their exam process has to become more written, and I don't know whether many electricians need to really write a decent essay, uh, whereas I'm fairly certain as an historian, I simply can't wire things or, you know, safely uh, install an electrical appliance uh, at all. So polytechnics becoming more like universities sounds like a good idea, but you can see why this might cause issues. Grants to students remained, though they were cut. Uh, it was deemed um, electoral suicide again to try and get rid of them because they wouldn't vote for a government that did that and people might kick against it. Council housing is the next focus. Um, Thatcher wanted a property-owning democracy. She was a great believer in Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes uh, believed that if you had a stake in society, you're more likely to support it. Without a stake in society, you'd be on the take, for want of a better phrase. You, you, how much could you take from other people? As Thatcher put it, the problem with socialism is that sooner or later you run out of other people's money. Which fundamentally, I think, misunderstands what socialism is, but it sounds pithy. And I don't think Thatcher believed it. I think it was a very pithy statement. I think she's very good at those. Um, and she said what you need is a stakeholder society. You need people to feel that they're part of um, the British polity, uh, Britain PLC, uh, Public Limited Company. And to do that, you need to own property. So what she wanted was to get rid of council housing and have people owning their own houses rather than renting them. And the easiest way to do that is to offer people the right to buy. Um, and the right to buy meant that if you'd been in a council house for a very long period of time, then what you could do is you could buy it at a knockdown rate because you've been kind of paying it off with your rent. Um, this, on the cusp of a property boom, meant that houses that were worth, say, I don't know, £48,000 could be bought for like a couple of hundred pounds. You can see how this is going to cause problems, but why it's going to be horrendously popular. So what were the effects of these things? Well, in terms of the NHS, there was competition between GPs. People tried to outdo one another, they tried to undercut one another, and they get dirty. This leads to delays, it leads to waiting lists for the very first time. And that's the interesting thing. Social, socialised healthcare does not necessarily cause waiting lists. Apparently, it's self-governing trusts. In terms of schools, it led to increased class sizes as uh, budget cuts were made and more people were taken on board and you tried to run things in a more efficient manner. Uh, so schools weren't kept open in areas where um, the children weren't, basically, where the demography didn't support it. Um, even if there was a demographic bubble coming up, if there was a dip, you could close the school. Uh, this leads to increased class sizes, which leads to the class sizes you're used to, a class size of 30 or, or 32. Um, there was also a lot of experimentation. So one of the earliest things was the school's history project, which tried to do history in a very project-based manner. Um, you might have noticed I'm a product of that system. Um, and that was good. It was educationally very viable. It was quite popular with teachers and students and the wider society at large. But the tests became crucial. Now you had to kind of measure what people had learned and that had to be in a standardized way, which is the beginning of the test culture you guys have grown up with. In terms of universities, there were more foreign students. Obviously, they pay more money. Uh, they've got to pay boards. They've got to pay tuition fees. They, they can be charged anything because they're not from this country. And as a consequence, we get more foreign students over. A lot of those stay here because they research things and they're good at it. Uh, this actually increases the economy, but you can see how this can cause problems given what we talked about with the race riots in the 1960s and the 1970s. Council housing, well, what this did was it doubled spending that councils had to make on mortgage subsidies, i.e. helping people who would got themselves into trouble and supporting people without work who were paying mortgages on houses. So it actually ended up costing the government more money to sell the houses than they could possibly have gained by selling them in the first place. However, it did increase home ownership by 12%, thus taking us a step closer to that idea of a property-owning democracy that Thatcher was keen on. The next thing we want to talk about is how Thatcher controlled her cabinet. Um, and this is crucial. When you think about Wilson, he did it through charm and he did it through argument. And you had that complaint that it sometimes took two hours to get down to the point of the meeting. Thatcher had a very different approach. And I don't know if I've told you the quote already, uh, but she said, when I was prime minister, I was much too busy to waste time by having meetings. How do you get to be a prime minister? How do you run the country with that kind of view? Well, first of all, you need a bit of background. In opposition, Thatcher had few allies. There were very few people that worked with her. There was Airy Neve, um, who uh, end up, ended up being killed by an IRA bomb. 
And that was about it. Most people underestimated her. Most people didn't like her. She got where she was by being very politically astute and being very determined. So it followed that when she created her cabinet, she had in mind uh, a system where she could stamp her authority and not have to worry about people undermining her the whole time. Her cabinet had to be chosen from people that owed something to her or those that had to be bought off. And she had to balance that very carefully. Also bear in mind, she liked experience herself. Um, she'd been a politician for a while, but she hadn't been, well, she hadn't had experience of running the party for very long before she was propelled into the office of prime minister. As a consequence, a lot of this she made up on the hoof. I say made up, clearly she'd been planning it. She's an astute political animal. Let's not underestimate her intelligence here. So she had two things to worry about. There were party loyalists, people who would always vote conservative. There were loyalists in the government themselves. And also when we're talking about Northern Ireland, there are actual loyalists uh, that are actual political, um, sorry, I keep touching my face. This is really bad for COVID-19. Please don't follow my example. Do as I say, not as I do. Um, and there were the grassroots, there were the party members. Uh, and party members had their own views on how things were going to run and they weren't necessarily as developed as your political analysts would have been. So the idea of grant maintained schools, for example, was not liked as much by the grassroots as it was liked by the, the, the loyalists within the party themselves, if that makes sense. She therefore created a cabinet with two types of people based on her uh, definition, the wets and the dries. Uh, the wets um, were people that showed themselves off a bit. Uh, they were flamboyant, but ultimately they didn't have much staying power. These are people like Pryor, like Pym and like Heseltine. Heseltine has amazing hair. If I get to his age and I have his hair, I will have considered myself to have done reasonably well. Uh, these were very flamboyant characters. They were um, very popular in their own way, but they didn't have much substance. There wasn't a perceived backbone. They were showpieces. The dries are the technocrats. They're the ones that know what they're doing, that are very um, hardworking, uh, that get the job done, but they're boring. Um, Jeffrey Howe, sad to say, even though he was played by Anthony Stewart Head, um, who holds a soft spot in my heart, um, in the film Thatcher, great film, not actually about Thatcher, it's about um, uh, Alzheimer's and the loss of identity and dementia. It's a fascinating film, do watch it. Um, but Geoffrey Howe um, was boring. Um, he had an unfortunate habit of spitting when he talked. Um, so he sprayed spittle the whole time. Um, and that made him dry. Um, weirdly for a man who spats a lot. Um, so Keith Joseph, boring. Good at his job, but boring. Couldn't really hold a crowd. Um, Norman Tebbit, not a nice man. Also boring. Um, also, you know, survived a bomb attempt on his life and had to uh, be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. So, you know, yeah. 1983 uh, onwards, she has decisive control. Why 1983? Well, you know from the elections, that's when she gets her landslide uh, majority. And it's when she kind of delivers on her promise. She gets a lot. I did what I said and it worked. And people go, well, yeah, fair play. It, it did. And they recognise that she is more popular than the party. And as a consequence, that she can pretty much do whatever she wants from 1983 onwards. From 1987, she grows even more powerful. But from 1983, she has what we call decisive control. So where did the opposition come from? She resigns, remember. She, she doesn't step down of her own accord. She is forced out. So where did the opposition come from? How can it go from her being able to control in a Bismarck-like way her cabinet by having individual meetings in the corridor and say, oh, well, everyone else agrees. Are you going to be the one to stop out? Or such and such has already agreed. Wow, you've got them on board. Um, I hope that made sense. Um, where does the opposition come from? Well, Hesseltine is the first one to break cover. Uh, there was a scandal involving uh, Westland helicopters in 1986, and it was found out uh, that a civil servant had made a mistake. Now, usually what happens in a government department when civil servants make mistakes is the government minister uh, 
takes the responsibility. He has, or she, has ultimate responsibility for their department. And it's an unwritten rule, and, and uh, well, the politicians among you will be able to tell you, uh, by all means, I hope you've got a group chat. Have a group chat. Um, talks only just politics, and it's a form of uh, collective responsibility. With the Westland scandal, uh, a, a minister blamed, uh, uh, well, blamed the civil service, and the civil servant had to lose their job. Hasseltine said, well, we can't have this, um, and I will not be party to it, and ends up stropping out of a cabinet meeting, and thus resigns. Um, and so you have the first cracks. You have the first indication that the cabinet under Thatcher is not united. Willie Whitelaw in 1987 also resigned. Um, now, he resigned for a number of reasons, um, and he resigned mainly for economic reasons and increasing antipathy to Europe, because remember the Conservatives were on board with the European project. They saw it as neoliberal. They saw it as a positive. They saw it as a way of rescuing the UK economy. And in many ways, it had uh, rescued it from what it could have been. And it taken it out of the doldrums that it was in in the 1960s and 70s. So Willie Whitelaw's resignation in 1987 again shows that there is opposition within Cabinet. The fact that Thatcher couldn't stop him, the fact that Thatcher was unable to replace him, um, easily showed. Um, in 1989, as a result of uh, community charge and a series of ideas, I'll pop a video in the, um, uh, or I probably have already popped video when you've seen the link for this actually, um, uh, Lawson and Howe follow in 1989. Howe um, doesn't stab Thatcher in the back, he stabs her repeatedly in the front um, in a speech in Parliament, which is amazing but a bit geeky, so I won't include a link to that, but you're by all means look it up. Um, they they uh, quit because of community charge and because of Thatcher's growing power craze. Uh, there's an element where she runs up to a camera after the um, birth of a grandchild and she sort of collars a, a news journalist and says, oh, we are a grandmother. Um, which, using the royal we when you're a prime minister, is not, not a good look. Uh, in November 1990 um, is when how does his speech industrial relations oh you can't see that because of my video can i change that if i minimize it now i've moved it on my screen i have no idea if it's worked on yours um hang on I'll put it over here ah, now hopefully it's moved on yours if it hasn't i apologize i'll read through uh, you've got the powerpoint attached already when it comes to industrial relations, the uh, sort of headline here is the miners' strike. Now, what were the aims? The aims were that the laws on trade unions were unrealistic, um, uh, and that trade unions themselves were unfair. Uh, they gave undue weight to people in a union against people who were not in a union. Uh, they gave undue weight to the unions themselves against people that were not working in that industry. So when you're thinking about coal miners, uh, and there's a reason I'm using that example, uh, it gave undue weight to the miners themselves, and it allowed people who relied on coal supplies to keep their houses warm to be held to ransom by those unions. Uh, Thatcher said, well, you don't elect the leader of a union. Well, actually you do, but not in a general election. And therefore, they're undemocratic. They, they allow sections of society to have more power than other sections of society. And by definition, that's not democratic. Union power, they further argued, was bad for business. It meant that businesses constantly had to feel under threat and had to make decisions based on what they thought the unions would wear rather than what was efficient and what was necessary. Therefore, so went the argument, if there was less power to the unions, more jobs would be available to be created because you could lower the wages and therefore more people would be in work and unemployment would go down. You've got to bear in mind elections. If you can keep unemployment on a downward term, people will find you popular. It's simple as that. So what does she do? She does the legislation. Um, the first thing she passes is the Employment Act in 1980, which said that you didn't have to join a union to be part of a particular area. So you were no longer allowed to say that you had to be unionized. Um, there's another Employment Act in 1982, which um, says you've got to send out paper ballots. And it occurs to me, I haven't got the textbook with me, so you've probably got better views on this than I have. Do read the PDF, because I rather suspect that's where the answers are. Uh, the Trade Union Act of 1984, uh, you can see the dating of this. This is the beginning of the miners' strike, and I have not got my stuff in front of me. I am underprepared. Um, so yeah, read the PDF. It's got everything you need. You'll see that this follows 
very closely the textbook. So if you're reading that right now, follow that up. I apologize. Um, in the words of card games, I have whiffed this moment and I apologize. Um, hang on. Yeah, it's actually quite late at night. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to skip it. Please bear with. Um, what happens as a result of all these? There is success. They achieve their aims. They, they uh, nobble the unions, for want of a better phrase. They become less powerful. And there are less strikes. But it leads to high unemployment. It does not create more jobs. What it actually creates is management that's able to get rid of what they see as wastage. It creates the ability of people to load more work onto less people. Um, and... That trend of low membership of unions continues, certainly, and it allows the employers to do even more. Now, we end up with a situation today where most people are not part of a union and people complain about unions and say, well, why should they go on strike? Why should I have my day ruined by a travel strike on the tube, for example? Um, what what's in it for me uh which is fair but you've got to realize that that's the point of a strike and if it's got to that point then negotiations have already broken down so yeah um it's not all good is my point the miners strike was an attempt by the coal miners to do to thatcher what the coal miners had done to heath in the 1970s it didn't work this time the government were prepared they kind of knew it was coming and when it didn't happen initially they made it happen. They forced the coal miners into strike. Why? Because they wanted to have their reckoning and they were ready for it. Uh, the National Coal Board, that is the nationalized uh, industry of coal mining, um, was making losses around about 250 million pounds a year. Um, and they'd already closed pits. Um, each time they close a pit, a pit is a, a mine where people basically go down and get coal. I don't understand all of that. Uh, you guys live in a mining area. I never have. Um, so ask some people. They will know. Uh, and there were 20... Oh, God, I've done it again. Don't do it. Uh, there were 20,000 jobs lost uh, initially. This is massive in the industry, and the miners were understandably upset. They're worried about further closed pits, and so they react, uh, as only they know how. They, they'll hold a strike, and they believe the people will be on their side. Except this time, they weren't. So the government were not only prepared, they didn't only have stockpiles of coal to prevent this being a major problem. Uh, they'd acted on a report in 1981 that had looked into the strikes in 1974 and how best to combat that. Um, and what they did there was they changed their rhetoric, the enemy within, um, and they changed their methods. Uh, the police were deployed far earlier. Um, certain plants were controlled. Flying pickets officially banned and wildcat strikes officially banned uh was semi-encouraged uh, if you're interested in this by the way there's a brilliant video i think it's on youtube still uh where they reenact um one of the key acts of the miners strike uh the battle of orgreave um that's o-r-g-r-e-a-v-e -E, the battle of orgreave um and it is fascinating certainly the early bits where you get the original strikers and policemen talking about their experiences at the time and they were saying that there were signs up trying to get all the miners to go to certain places so that the police could essentially corral them um and, and they talk about that in more detail there the point is the government was prepared um the police were given extra powers by the home secretary leon britain uh and there's rumors that army were involved and again if you watch that battle of orgreave you'll hear both sides discussing those rumors um, with varying degrees of belief the miners themselves were no longer united because you got rid of single unions there were two different unions for the miners there was a union of uh, the national miners union sorry and the uh union of democratic miners um, the NMU was led by Scargill, and they're the ones that called the strike. The UDM was uh, set up in response to that by miners that said, well, no, this is the industry. I want to keep my job. I don't want to go on a long strike where I might risk losing my job and thus my livelihood and have my family starve. So in Derbyshire, for example, the UDM held the upper hand and the pits here did not go on strike. In Yorkshire, the NMU held the upper hand and the pits went on strike. This caused massive resentment and massive division within the coal mining community and also transmitted itself across the, the the population of the country now i was growing up at the time in carlisle therefore there were no miners i knew about it but it wasn't visceral 
a colleague of mine from an old school, they lived in a village and they themselves were not miners. And they said that uh, when miners came around asking for food, because it did get to that stage where people were actually starving to death, um, they had nothing to spare, was how they put it. But it was interesting that the way they phrased it, um, we had nothing to spare, but then later on we talk about, yeah, but the miners were wrong. And that is fascinating. You end up with these divisions in society. And it prompted Thatcher's famous statement that there is no such thing as society. And what this did was it allowed the government to essentially crack the unions. If the National Miners Union, the largest union of the day, the most powerful union of the day, was unable to do what they'd done in 1974, then no union could. And it was widely recognised, therefore, that the government had power in a way that they hadn't previously done. The timing of the strike in summer was bad. I mean, obviously, people aren't heating their homes in the height of the summer, so therefore people need less coal anyway. Going on strike and therefore stopping production doesn't really have much of an effect. Uh, Scargill himself was a bit of an extremist. Yes, he was part of Labour. Yes, he was still part of this British socialism. Though, again, if you look back, and this is very emotionally charged, people will claim that he's far more than that. And in fairness, he did set up a Stalinist party in the 1990s. So there's some truth to it. He is an extremist. This led to violent clashes. I've told you about the Battle of Orgreave. Do look the video up. It's amazing. Uh, and it led to massive unemployment and grinding poverty and the use of force. Um, it also had the use of media. Um, we now know that in many of the news reports, things were spliced together very deliberately so that it looked like the unions started the violence before the police did baton charges. Whereas if you actually look at the records and indeed the actual footage itself that's date stamped, you will find that the police often started the violent acts and that was very deliberately done. And of course, News-wise, media-wise, it's far better to show people attacking police before police attack back because people like to side with the police. We, we like our police. At the moment, we're calling them key workers, for goodness sake. We're clapping them on a Thursday. Very uncomfortable with that, but there we go. More on that another time. Um, but that in itself is fascinating. Um, ultimately, it's a, a success for Thatcher and Thatcher's leadership. It is seen as her victory, not the victory of the Conservatives, Thatcher's victory. And that's within the Conservative Party as well. And that's crucial. It gives her a lot of authority and creates a fair amount of fear for people who actually oppose her. Um, it also spells doom for the unions. Ultimately, this is the last time that unions will ever really play a major role in British political history, at least in our period. Um, and so from this point onwards, you can pretty much put them to one side. This is the end of that theme. Um, however, and this is worth bearing in mind, it is a hugely divisive issue and you'll find many commentators on both sides, even today, still arguing the case. This is the joy of history. Um, my view on it is dispassionate as much as it can be in that I have no skin in the game. I was not uh, from a mining community. I'm not from a community that was uh, divided by the mining, nor was I from a household that was using coal, nor was my local area even powered by coal. We had one of the first nuclear power plants, for goodness sake. So... Ultimately, I have no skin in the game. I, I am entirely dispassionate on this. Bear in mind that a lot of other people aren't, and they will have views. Do go look them up. Have a look at this alive issue. Um, we're learning about it for an exam. How do you use this in an exam? Well, the same way you use anything else. If you're asked, why is that just so successful? Part of the reason is her legislation and the miners' strike. Um, now, there's a homework here, and it occurs to me you can't see all of it, but you'll have seen this already. Um, we're going to talk about why it was Thatcher eventually damaged her own party and thus the government. Um, because ultimately, the Thatcherite experiment will end, well, in success for Thatcherism, but in failure for Thatcher. So what was the problem? And there are four areas I want you to look at. Um, they're down the side there. Sorry, down the... I don't know where the video is on your version, my apologies. Uh, but down the side, you can see the four factors and there's the standard three columns. What does she do? How is it important? Compare the fact the factors and then give it a mark out of 10 uh, in terms of relative importance. It's that relative importance that's important in your essays. The last essays you gave me, uh, those that I've marked so far, they all have wonderful analysis, this idea of doing two sides and creating a, uh, an argument and a critical evaluation. What they don't have is that relative importance where you compare the different factors in their importance for the overall conclusion. Now, I recognize the questions don't ask for that, but as good historians, you should be saying why it is you believe a particular thing. And that is what this final column is all about. Um, because, um, 
Yeah, because the whole point of uh, the history essay is to make an argument, to pre present a case, and to come up with a sustained judgment. Now, you're all very good at sustained judgment. You end, the same, uh, end with the same judgment at the end of each section of the essay. Then you come to a conclusion where you reflect the judgment in your introduction and you say, these are the facts I said I was going to look at. I looked at them. This is how they array. What you haven't yet mastered, most of you, and some of you are moving this way, is this idea of comparing the different factors to say, well, this is the one that means this is why I think what I do. This is the most important. This next one is less important. And this last one that goes against it actually doesn't do that much. It's, it's the weakest of all the arguments, the weakest of all the factors. It is the least important of them all. So the fact that it is different to what I have to say means that I'm not going to change my opinion. This allows you to make some very sophisticated arguments, by the way. One thing you can do, and I, I do like this one, is where you take uh, one factor and say, all right, the factor here is the most important factor and it, it supports my judgment. These next two factors totally don't. They totally trash my argument. And yet, you see, they're not as important as that first factor. That first factor outweighs both of the other two. And that is why I've come up with my conclusion. Unless you are comparing in relative importance, you don't get to make those kind of sophisticated arguments. And that is basically where we go with this. So, um, oops, sorry, the homework. Let me get back to it. Uh, there. Oh, no, I've got to click that bit. Apologies, I'm, I'm still learning. Um, oh, yeah, I've got to click it. There we go. So the homework on this, <laughs> homework, everything's homework, is to complete this table on why Thatcher resigned using the booklet. That will be the PDF that we've given you. And any extra research you care to use. Be wary for reasons I've already explained. And a score out of 10 for each factor. Be prepared to explain why you think this. It says due Friday's lesson. There isn't a lesson on Friday. So my proposal is this. You can fill it in. And if you wish, like with the last chart, you can take a picture of it or do it electronically, send it in, ask me to have a look at it. But if you're happy with it, that's fine. Um, the important thing is that it's done. This is to support you. I am sorry this is taking longer than it should have done. Um, I've kind of messed up here. Um, before half term, we would have done all of this, but I put the homeworks on in a different order. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, we don't have exams. It's not a major issue. So I can keep going throughout the entirety of the next term, and that's fine. I don't know how long this video is, by the way. Um, so yeah, that's the thing that I'm going to ask you to do. Best of luck with it. Do comment on the homework bit if you need any help. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a lovely day, Year 12. Uh, stay safe. Remain at home. And um, I'll see you on the flip side. Um, or will, as soon as I've managed to uh, 